I walked around the front of the building where there was a payphone attached. What I hadn't realized was that a storm cloud had blown up over the lake. And so we're right next to the lake. So I walk over and I'm going to call my mom and I put in the code and the phone and I'm trying to get her on the payphone and I heard a huge crack. And this big flash of light came out of the phone and it hit me right in the face and just threw me back like a rag doll. I fully expected that when you died, something would happen to tell you. You know, bells, whistles, who knows what. But it wasn't. It was just a very natural progression of, I was in this state, this second, and the next second I was someplace else. I went from being in a physical form to being in a spiritual form. My name is Anthony David Sicoria. I grew up in Kingston, New York. I was there for my first 18 years. I had gotten into some trouble my last year in high school. Stupid things that teenagers do. My high school football coach had gone to the Citadel, which was a military school in South Carolina. He put a bug in my father's ear that I needed to go to the Citadel because I needed some mild corrections. And so my, I remember my father saying, well, you can go to any school you want to, but if you don't go to the Citadel, don't come home. I thought, okay, <laughs> that makes it pretty simple choice. So I went to the Citadel and uh, played football there and got my education in biology. When I was there, my last year, I had the honor of working with Albert St. Georgie, who was a Nobel Prize winner, um, who defined um, the way muscle worked. At that time, it made me realize that that's what I wanted to do. And I kind of had this vision of being one of the lab rats that worked in the basement of some big institution and learned all kinds of great things. So I decided to go to graduate school, and I spent the next five years getting my doctorate in physiology with a minor in biophysics. When I finished my graduate degree, there were no jobs. Um, and what had happened was there were a lot of people that had gone um, to graduate school to get out of the war, the Vietnam War. Because of the war ending, when I graduated, there was a glut of PhDs who just came onto the market. And as a result of that, there were no real good jobs. And so I thought, you know what, I need to make a, another decision. And I th thought, I'm going to go to medical school. At the end of it, I was trying to decide what kind of a physician I wanted to be. And I settled on orthopedics because I was one of those kids that loved taking things apart, putting them back together and rebuilding things. And I think because of my Italian heritage, I had some carpentry genes um, that were buried in there someplace. Uh, and so that's what I settled on. In 1994, my wife had five people with birthdays in the month of August. So every year we would have a communal birthday party. And they had picked a place called Sleepy Hollow Lake. At the lake, there were pavilions that you could rent. And she rented one um, that would hold 25 plus people. And that was gonna be our, our August get together. I was given the job of 
running the barbecue. So I was outside getting the food ready and most everybody else was upstairs in the pavilion. And at the beginning of the day, it was beautiful outside. Sun was shining, it was a pleasant temperature and everything seemed good. At some point, I had decided I should call my mom to check on her because she was not going to be there. By this time, my, my dad had already passed, so um, my mom was there by herself, and I wanted to check on her. And so I, I got somebody to cover the barbecue, and I walked around the front of the building where there was a payphone attached. What I hadn't realized was that a storm cloud had blown up over the lake, and so we're right next to the lake. Um, so I walk over, and I'm going to call my mom, and I put in the code and the phone, and I'm trying to get her on the payphone, and I let it ring five, six, seven times, and she didn't pick up, so I thought, all right, she's busy. Um, I'll try her again later, and as I started to take the phone away from my face to hang it up, I heard a huge crack, and this big flash of light came out of the phone and it hit me right in the face and just threw me back like a rag doll. And as it threw me back, I had the strangest sensation of moving forward. And, and I remember standing there going, this doesn't make any sense. I know I saw the lightning, I knew I'd been hit, and I knew I'd been thrown backwards, but now I'm standing here and, and nothing's making sense. And I look at the phone and the phone's dangling and I'm just standing there, just absolutely bewildered. And at that point, I hear my mother-in-law screaming, and she's at the top of the stairs. I'm at the bottom of the stairs. And she starts running down the stairs, headed right at me. And I thought, this can't be good when your mother-in-law's running at you, screaming that something's bad. As she got down in front of me, she was looking off to her left. and. And I thought, this is really strange. And it's like I wasn't even there. And I'm, and I'm like, what the hell? And I turn to go where she's going. And I took about three steps. And I run into myself on the ground. And I'm like, oh, shit, I'm dead. And it was such a shock. I fully expected that when you died, there would be some sort of a anything, something would happen to tell you, you know, bells, whistles, who knows what. But there would be some sort of a signal that, hey, buddy, you're dead. Um, but there wasn't. It was just a very natural progression of, I was in this state, this second, and the next second I was someplace else. I went from being in, in a physical form to being in a spiritual form. There was a lady who was waiting to use the phone. She gets down to start doing CPR. Turns out she's a nurse. And I'm standing there and I'm trying to call out to anybody who will listen. And I don't see, you know, I can see all of them. I can hear all of them, but nobody can see or hear me. And then it occurred to me that I'm standing here and I'm thinking exactly the way I normally would. I have complete control of my mind, and I'm thinking in the vernacular in the way that I normally would think, and I'm having these massive racing thoughts are going through my head trying to make sense of this whole thing. But I realized at that moment that whoever I am, I always am, and there's no such thing as death. And, you know, my spirit or whoever I was is eternal. And that was probably the first big thing that realization that came to me as, as this whole thing unfolded was that my spirit is here forever. So we're essentially two people, you know, we're in this body, which is nothing more than uh, a costume over the top of, of who we are always and in our spirit form and you know when i went up to the to the body and i and i looked at it and um 
I mean, seemed to be very dispassionate about it. It was like, that's me, but it's not. You know, I'm, I'm me. I'm still who I always was, and that's nothing but an empty shell. And, and that, was, that was pretty earth-shaking. It was not a frightening experience. It was, you know, it was just very matter-of-factly, this is the way things really are. And then I thought, well, there's no point in standing here because nobody can see me or hear me. And I turned around and I start to walk toward the stairs and I'm gonna go up the stairs and check on my family. And I started up the stairs and I got to about the third step and I'm looking down at the ground and I start to see my legs dissolve. And I thought, well, okay, this is getting really weird. Um, and as I got to the top of the stairs, I had lost all form. I was just a ball of energy. The stairs, when you get to the top of the first level, it goes up another few steps to the left. And I didn't bother with that. I, I had no form. I just went through the wall. And when I came out on the other side of the wall, I came out right over the top of my wife, who was sitting painting children's faces. And I, I remember taking a picture in my head of, of who was there, what kids were there, how the furniture was arranged, and what order the kids were standing in. And that became an important issue later on when we were comparing notes. And I was able to say all these things that verified the fact that, yeah, I did see it, and I was there. I continued going through that room. And when I got out of the room and went through the roof, and that's when things really got interesting, it was like I had suddenly fallen into a river of pure positive energy. There was a bluish white light that this energy emanated from. If you could imagine an energy that's completely composed of love and peace, there were no other emotions no other senses that I had uh, except that. And it was, it was just earth-shaking to feel that much love and peace coming from this source. And it came to me that this must be the God energy. This is what makes everything. And I thought, you know, this is the greatest thing that could ever happen to somebody to, to have this realization and to have this feeling. And that's the only time I've ever experienced anything like that um, and in my whole life. At that point, I realized that I was going someplace. I started to see a collage of high points and low points in my life. It was just, there wasn't a lot of explanation or, or, or thought. It was just, there's pictures of, of different things in my life. High points, low points, um, trauma, whatever it was. And at that point, I was just kind of settling into flowing in the stream. I didn't know where it was going or where it was taking me, but it was exciting. Um, and uh, it was almost, it was an ecstasy. Um, it was such a wonderful feeling. And then all of a sudden, it's like somebody flipped a switch. Suddenly I was in pain. And I was back in my body, calling out loud in, in my head um, to whoever would listen that, you know, please don't make me do this. I, yeah, I don't want to go back. And I had three kids and, and a wife, and, and I loved my life. Um, but there was no comparison to what I was experiencing outside my body. I was like, please don't make me do this. I, I was really angry. I wanted, to, I wanted to stay where I was because I went from absolute bliss to absolute pain. I mean, where this thing hit me in the face, and where it came out my foot looked like two hot pokers. 
but I realized that, you know, it's not my choice. And so the, the lady who was doing CPR had stopped and she was kneeling next to me. And it took several minutes before I, I was conscious to be able to open my eyes. And when I opened my eyes, everything was really out of focus. And I wanted to say something to thank her. And unfortunately, what came out was, I'm a doctor, it, you know, it, it's okay. <laughs> like, you know, what a stupid thing to say. And so I realized at that point that, okay, you're not thinking very clearly, you know, just shut up and, and just wait this out. You know, of course, everybody starts running over and they call an ambulance and they call the police. And I thought, I don't want to go sit in the emergency room for four to six hours to have somebody tell me I'm alive. So I opted to just have them take me home and I called my cardiologist friends and my neurologist friends. And I said, you know, this happened. And they said, we'll come right over and went to their offices. And, and everybody said the same thing. It's like, well, you're lucky you're alive. After my near death experience, I was afraid to say anything to anybody. This was, you know, in the early 90s. And at that time, um, you know, somebody could call the state and say, this guy's kind of loose around the edges. Um, you might want to pull his license because he's saying things that don't make a lot of sense. I kept my mouth shut for the most part. Um, I talked to friends and family um, about it, but, you know, it was, I wasn't going to embarrass myself and, and have people call me a lunatic either. Before the lightning, I was on a road for academic orthopedics. I wanted to publish papers, and I was a, a chairman of a big spine meeting um, every every year. And you know, I was I was going down that road, and none of those things seemed to be important anymore. I was really in a you know kind of lost. I was beginning to wonder why did I go through this because it wasn't making a whole lot of sense to me. And then all of a sudden, I started to have this insatiable desire to hear classical piano music, which was, that was a big departure for me. I was a kid of the 60s. Um, there was rock and roll. There really wasn't much of anything else. But now all of a sudden, I'm, I'm having this desire to hear the classical piano stuff. And it was so such a strong feeling that I actually I drove to Albany because it was the closest place that would have classical piano CDs. I remember when I went in there that this CD of Vladimir Ashkenazi playing his favorite Chopin just jumped off the shelf into my hands. And I thought, okay, this obviously is something I'm supposed to have. And so I, I bought the CD and I started listening to it and I was absolutely captivated. I could not stop listening. Um, and I listened to it all day long. And then very shortly after that, I realized that it was not going to be enough to be able to listen to this music. I needed to learn how to play it. And that was a big problem since I didn't have a piano and I didn't know how to play. So, you know, I was like, okay, well now what do I do? Well, the very next day, our one of our babysitters um, came by and said, I'm, I'm moving, you know, and I had this old upright piano that I wanna, I wanna keep, but could I store it at your house for a year? And I thought, okay, this is kind of weird. Um, you know, I have this thought yesterday that I need a piano and suddenly a piano's here. So I started to try to teach myself how to play. And a couple of weeks into it, I have a dream. And in this dream, I'm walking out onto a stage. And on the stage, I see myself, and I'm playing in a concert hall, and I'm playing music. 
on a piano. And as I'm walking toward myself, I come to the realization that this is not somebody else's music. This is mine. The music had a loud ending and it woke me up out of a sound sleep. And I remember sitting up on the edge of the bed and I looked at the time, it was 3.15 in the morning. And I thought, well, let me go out to this piano. And I started trying to plunk out different notes of, of things that I heard, but I had no idea how to write music and I had no idea how to play it either. Um, so I said, the hell with this, and I went back to bed. But from that moment on, whenever I went to the piano, the music from the dream would start to play. And it would play all the time. And, and if I ignored it, it would start to play when I didn't want it to. I was trying to concentrate on surgery. I was trying to do something else. It was that, that powerful inside of me that, you know, it was like, okay, this is much more than I understand that it is. And the next day I went out and I had to find a program to teach how to write music. And there was a program called Sibelius, which is essentially writing music for dummies. And I was able to take that, that program and would start to write the music from the dream. And I spent the next seven months, every single free minute I had, and I really went off the deep end with the music. I, I literally got up at 4.30 and I would practice till 6.30 when I had to go to work. And then I would, I would do my 12 or 14 hours. And when I came home, it was time to put kids to bed. And then as soon as they were in bed, I was back at the piano and I was, I was there till 12, one o'clock. I was absolutely possessed by the music and the piano and nothing else was important. One thing that I have found with the music is that it takes me about as close to that feeling, that euphoria of being on the other side as I can get. It's almost like there's a, a connection that I, I can access. It's a frequency that I'm able to tune into. And, you know, in reading about other composers, um, you know, the great composers all said the same thing. Um, Mozart was most prolific about it. And he said, you know, the music would come to me in finished form. And all I did was write it down. And, you know, lots of people have speculated that our brain is nothing more than a receiver. There's no way in the world it could house all the information that we have access to. There's some off-site place that we are able to communicate with. Life exists after death. We're in this form for a certain period of time, and then we leave this form and we become something else. So there's, it's just a continuum uh, of existence. You keep going through this, um, this process, you reincarnate as something else or someone else. Your spirit continues and you go through an evolution of, of learning and phases of, of healing and understanding of, of what you experienced in this present life and what you're gonna work on in the next one. I mean, that's what we're here for. We're here to learn and to experience and to evolve spiritually into a higher being than what we are now. The way I look at it is everybody can go back to the source, but you have to earn your way back. And you do that by going through proving grounds, if you will, um, 
you experientially develop, you know, there's two polarities. There's positive and negative. Um, and moving along a positive polarity is service to others as opposed to the negative, which is service to self. And if, if you can think along the line of service to others in your daily life, then that gives you a, a, a more of an advantage to, to grow spiritually and ultimately find your way home. Rejoin with the source from whence everything came. This was the greatest thing that I've ever experienced in my life. I was given an opportunity to, to see what happens after death. Death is not to be feared. It's just a changing form. You still exist as whoever you are and always will be. Before the lightning experience, I was very grounded in science, in terms of, you know, what is reality. And now I completely understand that there's much more um, to our existence than we have any idea of. If everybody could experience that before they die, they would have a whole different perspective on life. and and what we're doing here, and it would change everything.